Well, is anybody glad you came to church this weekend? Come on, anybody. Come on, can you lift up a one more shout of praise to Jesus? Come on. Can we honor Jesus in the house today? It is always an honor to worship with you. Why don't you, before you're seated at all of our locations, turn to somebody you're standing beside and tell them how good they look today, how good they sounded. And I, I, wanna, I wanna welcome uh, every one of our locations gathered, Short North, Polaris, Whitehall, Hilliard. I wanna welcome those tuned in on television, Online, I want to welcome the men and women joining us right now, tuned in from hundreds of prisons and correctional facilities from all across the nation. It is an honor to bring this worship experience to you. I found out this morning that I get to meet a group from ORW who are here today. Come on, can we make some noise for, for ORW, those who are here and those who are watching from that facility? God is doing something really powerful in, in the church right now. I don't know, uh, for those of you who were here with us on Wednesday night, what y'all thought, but I thought Wednesday night's prayer and worship service was incredible. It was a full house, and the worship, there, there was just a, an a extra special anointing I felt on the worship, and, and the time of prayer was powerful. And I really, really, really enjoyed calling all the young men up to the front, all the men 28 years old and under. And I was just so encouraged by what I saw because this altar was just full and every, every aisle was full. We couldn't get them all to the front. There were just so many young men who, I mean, just pockets and pockets and pockets and pockets who came ready to worship and were just going all out for the Lord. And, and uh, so we, we got to pray over them and prophesy over them and just ask the Lord to bless this generation and, and raise up some strong men in this generation full of faith and fire and courage and Holy Spirit power. And, and, uh, and then I, I asked all the, the men at the front who had hands lifted like this as we were praying over them, I said, now I want you all to turn with hands lifted and pray over everyone in the house. And um, that was really powerful. My, my daughter said, Dad, we were standing in the front row. And it was very cool when you called all the young men to the front until you told them to turn around because we were right there. And they were like this. And uh, one of my daughters said, one, one of the guys was like worshiping like this. And it was like the Matrix. Every time he moved, I had to... Uh, but that's what a night of prayer and worship will do for you. You, you get to got to move a little bit and um boy the holy spirit was moving it was so 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 awesome and um if you're wondering when the next one is i don't know i think it's in about a month or so we're about uh, we're, we're sort of on that track right now to, to just feeling the need to gather the church uh probably monthly because there's something special that's happening right now there's a hunger in, in the church and um, i'm just so so incredibly proud of you and uh, everything that we get to do together to reach our city and to bring hope and healing to our city and to the many who can't be here, that, that you're so generous that you would allow us to invest the resources needed to reach those who can't get here on their own. Thank you. Thank you for being just an incredible church, a generous church, a life-giving church, a spirit-filled church, a church always willing to go and do whatever it takes, no matter the cost, to reach people who are lost and hopeless and in desperate need of Jesus. Today, we've got a special treat in store for you. You're going to hear from a very, very dear friend of mine, one, one, of, one of the most incredible people that I know and most incredible couples and most incredible families that uh, my family knows, the Cooper family from Oklahoma City, Pastor Herbert and Tiffany Cooper and their entire family are on the front row and They've been pastoring People's Church in Oklahoma City for 21 years now, and Pastor Herbert's been in ministry for about 30. We serve on the lead team of ARC together, and um, they were a family that my wife and I, we just were very intentional. We were watching them from a distance, and several years ago, we, we just decided, we said, you know, we need to lean in, reach out, 
and just try to get to know them. And when we did, we, we brought Pastor Herbert here, I think, what, two years ago, um, and just really started spending time. And then we went to visit them, spent time in their church, and what an incredible, powerful church it is, People's Church in Oklahoma City. God's doing something incredible. Their kids are on fire for the Lord. And when you have four kids and you're in ministry, um, man, it's just, it's amazing to see the, the, the love that each one of you has for Jesus. And as a pastor and as a dad, I look for families that are doing what we're doing with kids that are teenagers, that still love Jesus, and that have a heart for ministry and wanna give themselves wholly and fully to the Lord. And it's one of the reasons that we reached out to your family that many years ago. And um, it's why you're here today, because we love you. And, and the influence that you have is incredible. And so I want my girls to be around you. And I want them to see what a, just an incredible family you are. And I want you to be around our church. And so would you do me a favor at every location? Would you just go ahead and stand up on your feet? And I can't say enough about Pastor Herbert, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop and let him preach. Would you give a Rock City welcome? Come on to Pastor Herbert Cooper right here. Come on, give it up for Jesus. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on, take 10 seconds and give them your best praise. Your best praise. You're worthy. We honor you. We love you. We magnify you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Why, it's so good to be back at, at Rock City. And what a church. Man, this, this is not just... Uh, a church, but this is a movement. Yeah, this is a move of God, and lives are just being transformed, and people coming to Christ. And I, I got so full of faith yesterday. Got to hang out with your pastors, and we went to Polaris. And hey, the steel is coming up, y'all, at the Polaris location, man. I I got so fired up looking at that steel or walking that ground. I'm trying to move some of that steel to Oklahoma. Come on, somebody. I'm, I'm like, come on, let's get me a building in Oklahoma going. I just, gosh, just what the vision here and what God is doing is just special. And I, I love your pastors, and I know that you love them, but uh, their integrity and their love for you and just spent all day with them yesterday in their house and dinner and talking and and laughing and talking about the things of God and uh, just to be around uh, a church and leaders and pastors and their kids and uh, just exude Jesus and integrity, passion. And can we just thank God for Pastors Chad and Katie, their family. Come on, you can do better than that. We honor you. We love you. It's, it's a privilege to be your friends. Thank you for entrusting us to be here this weekend. And I do have my my family with me. There's a picture just so you can see them a little bit better of my family. And my oldest is Kel on the far left. He's uh, just finished his freshman year at Southeastern University. And then our second oldest on the far right, Mr. Cade, he's going to be a senior in high school. And then my baby girl, uh, she is going to be a junior in high school. And Karis, and then my youngest, Case, he is going to be a freshman in high school. And then... My girl, my baby mama. Yeah, my sweet thing. Yes, the gravy on my biscuits. I'm about to preach right now. My wife, this year will be 26 years of marriage to my best friend, Tiffany. Will my family stand real quick and just wave everybody? Come on, Tiffany, the kids, will y'all stand and wave for everybody? There's the Cooper crew. So glad to be here, our family. Well, I am excited uh, to preach today on this, this Memorial Day weekend. I'm just, I'm excited. I believe I got a word that's going to, to, to help you, going to speak to your life. And, and this weekend, some of you might be familiar with this, but this is a Pentecost weekend. And, and one, one of the things that I love about this church is just the moving of the Holy Spirit. 
even just hearing your pastor just talk about Wednesday night and just the moving of the Holy Spirit and an altar full of men worshiping Jesus and people just being touched by the power of God. Aren't you grateful that you're in a church where the Holy Spirit is moving? And I mean, God's Holy Spirit is, is moving and, and changing lives. And I love that about Rock City. And, and the Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter number one and verse number 13 that the very moment someone gives their life to Jesus, Jesus Christ, that they're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you at the very moment you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You are born again. You're, you're regenerated. You, you now are experiencing new life in Christ. Christ, And so understand that you're, you're saved and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. But then later in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18, it says that every single Christ follower can be filled and refilled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It says we should be continually filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And no matter how old you are, how young you are, no matter how long you've been in the faith, you need to be continually filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to exude the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to live a holy and a pure life. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to, to, to move and flow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be a blessing to our world. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us the, uh, the ability to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And so we need to be continually filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet there's one of the benefits of being full of the Holy Spirit that is so easily overlooked if we're not careful. And that is this. People full of the Holy Spirit are full of dreams and visions from God. You need to be full of the Holy Spirit so that you can know God's dream and that you can live out God's dream for your life. The Bible says it like this in Acts chapter number two in verse number 17 and 18. It says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams, even on my servants, both men and women. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And, and I love how the Bible says God will pour out his spirit on all people. God, God's pouring out his spirit in these last days on men and women. He's pouring out his spirit. It doesn't matter the color of your skin joining us online, no matter where you're watching around the world. God, his, God is pouring his spirit out on all people. And it says that the young men, the young women will see visions. And I just want you to know that God wants to use every single young person God's not waiting to use you one day, someday. God is pouring out his spirit right now in these last days, and God wants to use our young people. I just want to talk to all the young people right now. God's hand is on you, not for one day, someday. His hand is on you right now. He wants to use you to change your school, to change the neighborhood, to change the family. God wants to use every single young person, and I'm so grateful for Rock City. This is a church that believes in the next generation. I thank God for what's happening in all the kids' environments and all of you serving and volunteering, raising up young warriors for Jesus Christ. I thank God for what's happening here at the youth and every single Sunday night. Youth are gathering together in small groups and once a month we're having youth services. Hundreds of teenagers being full of the Holy Spirit to change their world for Jesus Christ. Hey, make sure your kids, your, your, your youth get to summer camp this summer. Your church is an amazing church investing in the next generation. Are you grateful for a church that believes in the next generation? Come on, God God is using you right now. His hand is on you right now. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on young men and young women. They'll see visions. And then the scripture says, and in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on old men, old women, and they will dream dreams. And I have not yet decided if I'm in the young club <laughs> or the old club. 
and I'm not going to let you decide for me today. I'll, fi- I'll figure that thing out later. But, 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 but if we're not careful, when you get a little older in the faith, you've been coming to church for some years, you're getting some gray hair, you can start thinking, well, this is for the young people. We'll let them serve in the kids' ministry. We'll let them serve in the youth ministry. We'll let them lead the small groups. We'll let them be ushers and greeters. We'll we'll let them do outreach. That's for the young people. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to relax. I'm going to chillax. I'm going to take it easy. I'm I'm, I'm going to retire. But in the kingdom of God, you never retire. You only refire. You might retire from your job. You'll retire from maybe from your career, but you never retire from the kingdom of God. And as long as there's breath in your body, God wants to pour out his spirit on old men, on old women, then you would dream dreams. Your best days are still ahead of you. God's not done with you, sir. God's not done with you, ma'am. It's not time to take it easy. It's time to push the kingdom of God forward. Come on, somebody. God is pouring out his spirit on all flesh. And every great move of God always begins with a dream. It always begins with a vision. I remember growing up in my little small town in Oklahoma called Wewoka, Oklahoma. I'm curious by a show of hands, all of our locations, how many of you ever been or at least know where Wewoka Oklahoma, yes, just wait, let's wave at me right now. <laughs> Two people in their line to make me feel good. <laughs> I got a couple of you been, no, we woke up. Well, I think everybody, my, my, my hometown's important to me, and I want you to know exactly where it's located, so let me give you some clues so you'll know where it is. It's right by Wilika, Wetumpka, Sasakwa, Holdenville, Seminole, Butner, and New Lima. Now wave at me if you know where it is. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Yeah, my little whole town, we woke up, and I came to faith in Christ in a football locker room. It was my senior year of high school, playing football, wanted to play some college football, and I was invited to the football locker room that night to a fellowship of Christian athletes meeting. And I went that Thursday night. I didn't go for, to hear preaching. I didn't go for Jesus. I went for pizza. Come on, somebody. I went for pizza that night, and I got Jesus. I believe in outreach. I thank God for a church of outreach and missions and and sharing the gospel and getting outside the four walls. I love this church, Dream Center. I love it because I came to faith through outreach, and I gave my life to Christ at the age of 17 in that football locker room. That next Sunday, I went to church, and I got water baptized. I got in a small group. My youth pastor saw something that I didn't see in myself, and he, he, he gave me the opportunity to preach. He said, I want you to preach to the youth group. So I went down in the basement. I, you know, I studied for 46 hours, and I preached for five minutes at 17, cotton mouth, but I preached, and I, I preached my first, my first sermon. He saw something in me, and, and, and I remember thinking, man, I, I, I got, God, God wants to use my life in some way, and I was supposed to be out mowing the grass, and I was in the front yard with the lawnmower, and, and I was standing on the ledge. In our home, we had a ledge that went out into the grass a little bit, and then the stairs in between the other ledge, there was another ledge that went out into the yard, and I was standing on one of those ledges. And the grass was kind of high, and the Oklahoma wind was blowing through the grass. And I, I just literally saw people. I didn't see grass. I saw people, and I began to preach to the grass. I mean, I began to preach, in Jesus' name, you will serve the Lord. God's going to use you. In the name of the Lord, get your life right with Jesus. I began to cry, and I was preaching my guts out screaming at the grass. I'm telling you, I saw it, I saw it, and I even gave an altar call and the grass got saved that day because I was preaching my guts out with tears streaming down my face, and that day I had a vision. People's church did not start 21 years ago. People's church started at the age of 17 when I was preaching to that grass, and God gave me a vision of my future. And I'm talking to somebody today. Every great move of God begins with a vision. It begins with a dream. That move of God you're believing to happen in your marriage begins with a dream. 
that move of God you're believing, the believing for to happen in your, with your kids, with your grandkids, it, be, it begins with a dream. That move of God you're believing to happen in your career, in your business, it begins with a dream. It begins with a vision from God. That move of God you're believing to happen in your education, your master's degree, your doctorate degree, it begins with a vision, a dream from God. Every great move of God always begins with a dream. And today I want to talk to you about a dreamer in the Bible. This dreamer's name is Joseph. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 37 and verse number 5 that Joseph had a dream And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. And understand something about Joseph's dream. Joseph had a dream from God. It's so vital that you and I have a dream from God. Because if you follow your dream instead of God's dream, things never turn out well. And so you've got to have God's dream for your life. You need God's dream for your dating. You need God's dream for your marriage. Listen, you don't want to do dating like the world does it. You don't want to do marriage like the world does. You, you, want, you want God's dream for your marriage. You want, you want God's dream for your parenting. You want God's dream for your education. You want God's dream for your career. You want God's dream, not your dream. And the scripture says it like this in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. When when, when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. Another translation says where there is no vision, people perish. Where there is no divine guidance, where there is no dream from God, where there is no revelation from God, where there is no vision from God, people run aimlessly. They, They run wild. They live life with no purpose. They they live life, and Scripture says, they perish. We need God's dream for our life. And Joseph had a dream from God. And then he encountered obstacle after obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. I believe that I'm on assignment today to talk to two groups of people. The first group are some of you don't have a dream from God and God's gonna give you a dream today. So so some of you are here and you had a dream when you were a kid, you had a dream when you were a teenager, but but that dream has lied dormant, you're not doing anything, you think that dream can't happen, Too too many mistakes have happened, life has passed you by, and you think that dream will never come to pass and God wants to reignite your heart today to let you know I still wanna bring that dream to pass in your life. God's gonna do that for you today. He's He's gonna touch your heart again today. And then there's another group of you that I'm on assignment to talk to today, and you have a dream from God and you're pursuing it but you keep hitting obstacle after obstacle after obstacle and you're discouraged some of you are disillusioned you're wondering man should I just quit because I keep hitting all these obstacles and today I believe I'm on assignment God wants to see that dream that he's given you come to pass in your life. And I want to help you overcome obstacles to see the dream come to pass. Let me give you five obstacles that stand in between you and your dream. Five obstacles from the life of Joseph that stands in between you and your dream. And the first is this, details stand between you and your dream. Understand, God gave Joseph a dream at the age of 17. He was going to be a leader. He was going to be powerful. He was going to be so so influential that one day he was going to even rule and reign over his own family. But yet, Joseph had no details at all. He had a dream from God but did not know when it was going to happen, how it would happen, or where it would happen. And over my life now, I've learned that's just how God works with all of us. He gives us a dream, and he doesn't give us all the details, if any. 
And I, I, I'm so glad he doesn't. Now, now that I've been serving God and been preaching for 30 years and been, been a pastor of our, our, our church, my wife and I, for 21 years, I'm so glad that when God gives me a dream, he doesn't give me all the details. Because if God would have showed me and Tiffany 21 years ago, uh, when he gave us that dream of people's church, if he would have showed us all that we were going to have to go through to get to where we are today, no thank you. No, thank you, Lord. Let somebody else do all of that. And so he gives us a dream, but he doesn't give us all the details. What God will do, he's going to give you this big dream. He's going to reignite the dream in your heart today. And he won't give you all the details, but God will always give you the next step. And what I'm about to teach you right now, it took me years to understand. It took me years to get my mind wrapped around. God gives dreams. God gives vision. He'll give big dreams. He'll give big vision. And God will rarely give you all the details, but he will always give you the next step. Let me just lay a little scriptural foundation for you. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. We make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. We have plans, we have dreams, we have visions, but God determines our steps. Psalm chapter 17, verse 5, my steps have stayed on your path. I have not wavered from following you. I need divine guidance, not just natural guidance. I got to stay on God's path and God will give me the next step. Job said in Job 23, verse 11, my feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. And, and Job was going through trials. He lost his family. They, 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 were, they were murdered. He lost all of his livelihood and income. And so many people, when they're going through the trials of life, they can begin to turn aside and quit following God's steps. But Job said, I kept following closely, and I, and I kept following his steps. Psalm chapter 119, verse, one, verse 133, guide my steps by your word, so I will not be overcome by evil. Can I say this is so important, Rock City? It's so important that you're in church every single Sunday you can. Like you ought to just set a goal. I'm going to make 45 a year. I'm going to make, I'm going to make 48 Sundays a year. I'm going to have my kids in church every Sunday. I'm going to have my students here on Sunday night. You say, why, Pastor? Why is this so important? Well, can I, can I tell you that the world, they're always giving us their ideologies. The world is always giving us their thoughts. The world is always pushing on us what they believe. And if we're going to counteract with what the world says, we got to counteract it with what the word says. We got to get the word word in our hearts and the word in our mind. We got to have our minds renewed by the word of God. Your teenagers, your kids need the word of God in their mind. And so we've got to get, get, get the preaching of the word and hear the teaching of the word and be in small groups together. Why? So that we can closely follow his steps. Jeremiah says this in chapter 10, verse 23, Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It's not for them to direct their steps. Wow. We don't ever want to be in a place where we're directing our own steps. Lord, let me be close to you. Know the Holy Spirit. Know the word of God so I can follow your steps. It's over and over and over and over again in the Bible. Let me show you one more passage, one more scripture. Psalm 37 verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. The steps, the steps, God gives you a dream, a vision, but he doesn't give you all the details. And here's what happened. People have a dream from God. They have a vision from God, and they're waiting. They're like paralyzed. Well, God, I can't do anything right now. You got to show me what's going to happen in 2024. Lord, don't you see this economy? Haven't you seen inflation? Have you seen my 401k, God? You want a brother to do what? God, kind of show me what's going to happen in 2024, 2025. God says, no, no, no. I've given you a vision. I've given you a dream. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the next step. And all you have to do is take the next step. Just take the next step. And then what God will do is you're pursuing the dream and vision. God will show you the next. And then you take that step. And then by faith, God will show you the next and you just take the next step. Details 
stand between you and the dream. Number two is this, number two, number two, number two. Adversity stands between you and your dream. So Joseph has this dream from God. And then in Genesis 37, his brothers hate him, want to kill him, sell him into slavery. Then you get to Genesis chapter 39, more adversity. He's falsely accused of rape. He's thrown into the prison. He has a dream from God and thrown into the prison. And then in Genesis chapter 40, the the chief cupbearer forgets about Joseph. He has to stay in the prison longer, 13 years of adversity before he ever begins to see the dream come to pass. And here's what I've learned about life. Here's what I've learned about following God's dream. No adversity, no destiny. No adversity, no destiny. No adversity, no destiny. You will always experience adversity on the way to seeing God's dream for your life, for your family, for your career, for your children, for your grandchildren to come to pass. I'm talking to somebody today. Just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not God. Just because you're going through trials and trouble does not mean you're not in the will of God. Listen, you can be going through trials and trouble and be right in the middle of God's will. I think about my own life, a dream on that porch of preaching in front of thousands of people. And and, and, and I knew knew God, God was doing something in my life. And I was the first person in my immediate family to go get a college education. And it was hard leaving my little town and what I knew. And it was challenging. Days I wanted to give up, but it was worth it that I kept pursuing the dream. I think about starting traveling full-time as an evangelist. I traveled across America and the world preaching. And and, Tiffany and I, we saw a lot of fruit in our traveling ministry. And God did so many great things, but it wasn't all easy. It was challenging. There were difficult days and and difficult seasons. And, And I think about 21 years ago when Tiffany and I started People's Church. We started in a mall in the AMC theater attached to a mall. And that first Sunday, Mother's Day, 2002, 65 people showed up. We counted everybody. Double check the count. Come on, when you just get started, come on, you count them in the hallway? Did you look in the bathroom? Everybody, you got everybody. (laughs) Get everybody. Counted them all up. And it was challenging. Went from running 65, nobody told me about the summer, Memorial Day, people go on vacation, started running 40, 50 people ready to quit, ready to to give up. And then the church began to grow and we bought some land. We were building our very first building. Here we are. You know, I'm I'm, I'm 29 years old. My wife's 27. We got this vision. We're building our first building. We're going forward, moving the kingdom of God forward. And one of the construction workers falls off our new building and dies. And it's all over the news. Adversity, adversity, adversity always stands between you and your destiny. Don't you quit because it's hard. Don't you stop praising God. Don't you stop coming to church. Don't you stop tithing. Don't you stop serving. Don't you give up. You got to keep moving when you're facing adversity. Number three, number three, number three, number three. The third obstacle is temptation stands between you and your dream. It says in Genesis chapter 39, verse number six, this is when Joseph was sold into slavery. He's now living in Egypt. And it says, so he left in Joseph's care everything he had. This is Potiphar. He's in Potiphar's house. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. I'm wondering how many men at all the locations. This is your testimony right here. Pastor, well built, times two, and handsome. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Verse seven, and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph because whenever you're pursuing God's dream and walking in the favor of God, the enemy will always take notice of you and said, come to bed with me. In Oklahoma, we call that the direct approach. (laughs) She didn't say, let's get a latte. She didn't say, can I cook you some ribs? She said, come to bed with me. But verse 8, I love verse 8. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted 
to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And every time we sin, it's always against the heart of God. It goes on to say in verse 10, and though she spoke to Joseph day after day, and no matter how much you pray, how much you read the Bible, how much you come to church, temptation will come your way day after day after day. And I love this. He refused to go to bed with her or to even be with her. In other words, he did not even entertain it. He didn't text her, just checking on you today. How you doing? He didn't jump in her social media DMs, just praying for you today. No! Verse 11 says, one day he went into the house to attend his, his duties, and, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Temptation always stands between you and your dream. And some of you today... You're getting close to the edge. You got a dream from God. You got a vision from God. And you keep asking yourself, how close can I get and still have the dream? And you're flirting with it. You're giving in. You're hanging around the wrong people. You're putting stuff in your mind that you shouldn't be putting in. And you're getting close to the edge. And God just sent me to tell somebody the dream that God has for your life. The vision is too powerful. It's too big. Don't you compromise. Don't you give in. Don't you start sinning. The only proper way to respond to temptation is just like Joseph responded. Run! Run! Because the dream is too powerful. That vision is too powerful. Don't you start compromising now. Don't you start living like everybody else now. You live set apart to God. Holy because the only way to respond to temptation is to run. So you can see the dream come to pass. Number four is this. Number four. Number four. The fourth obstacle. And that is selfishness stands between you and your dream. So we're going to fast forward in the story. Joseph is not now second in charge of Egypt. There's been seven good years in the land and lots of vegetation, lots of crops. And Joseph stored away lots of food during the seven good years. And then there was seven years of famine. And people began to be in need, hungry, needing food. Even on Joseph's brothers, his dad needed food, so they came to Egypt and Joseph provided for them, moved his family there. He's got the power, he's got the influence, he's in charge, he's got the resources. And Joseph says to his brothers in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he said, you intended to harm me, you no good dirty dogs, you punks, I'm gonna kill all of y'all. Somebody's like, really, that's what the Bible says? No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. It says this, you intended to harm me, but God. Let me pause here. He said, you intended to harm me, but this has never really been about me. This has always been about God. You intended to harm me, but the focus has always been about God. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You see, God's dream for your life is always connected to his purpose, not your purpose. God's dream for your life is always about his glory, not your glory. God's dream for your life, it includes you, but it's not all about you. It's about the saving of many lives. And God has a dream for you. God's going to give some of you incredible influence. You're going to have influence. People are going to know you. They're going to know your name. He's going to give you influence in this, in this community. He's going to 
give you influence in this state. He's going to give you influence in this nation. Some of you is going to give influence all around the world, but that influence is not about you. It's about the saving of many lives. Some of you, God is going to give you incredible wisdom. He's going to download wisdom in your heart and mind to solve complex problems around Columbus. He's going to give some of you such wisdom and insight and revelation to solve complex problems in this state, in our nation. I mean, some of you are going to have such wisdom. He's going to give you such wisdom to solve complex problems that even impact the world. But he's not doing it for your glory. It's about the saving of many lives. He's going to give some of you, he's given you incredible athletic abilities. And he's going to give you influence with that athletic gift. He's going to take you places that are going to blow your mind. He's going to give you resources that are going to blow your mind. But it's not for your glory. It's for the saving of many lives. Some of you, God is going to, he, he wants to give you millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, but it's not that you would leverage it all on yourself. No, it was that you would leverage it to see the kingdom of God go forward, to see the saving of many lives, to build the Polaris campus, to send missionaries around the world, to start more dream centers. It's about the saving of many lives. And the question is when God blesses you, can he trust you? If he gives you the power, if he gives you the influence, if he gives you the resources, will you say, but God, he's given me all of this for the saving of many lives. Selfishness will always stand between you and your dream. Number five, this is my favorite point. Haters stand between you and your dream. Just wave at the pastor right now. If you got a few haters in your life, just yeah, you got you got a few haters. Hey, the Bible says this in Genesis chapter thirty-seven, verse seventeen. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. So now we're back at the beginning of the story. He he has this dream from God. He's going to go check on his brothers. Verse eighteen says, but they saw him in the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Joseph's brothers, get the picture of this. I mean, this is his flesh and blood. I mean, they're in the house watching cartoons, eating pancakes, having Captain Crunch together. I mean, this is, this is his flesh and blood. In the house, having special meals, eating chitlins and hog malls and collard greens and black eyed peas and yams. Mmm. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but that's okay. That's all right. That's all right. This is his family. And they're plotting to kill him over his dream. And then it says the next verse, verse 19. His brothers say, here comes that dreamer. They said to each other, my prayer for Rock City is that when people see you, they say, here comes that dreamer. When people see you at your workplace, when they see you at home, when they see you in the neighborhood, when they see you at school, they say, here comes that dreamer. They always got a dream. They always believe the best is yet to come. They're always full of hope. They always believe God's going to send revival. They always believe God's going to save those lost people. They always believe God's going to heal. They always believe God's going to set them free. They always believe the best. Here comes that dreamer. Verse 20 says, come now. Let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue. Come on, everybody shout, rescue. He tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and to take him back to his father. All of Joseph's brothers wanted to kill him, except for Reuben. Reuben wanted to keep the dreamer alive. And, and so many things are trying to kill your dream. Discouragement. Sin. Mistakes. Failure. Insecurity trying to kill your dream. Some haters, the devil trying to kill your dream. 
you feel it. Like you feel resistant to you. You feel obstacles. Some of you are ready to quit and ready to give up. And God's giving you a dream. He's giving you a vision. And God sent me here today to be somebody's Reuben. God sent me here to keep the dreamer alive. God sent me here today to talk to somebody and say that dream's going to still come to pass. I'm somebody's Reuben today, and God sent me here to tell you you've taken a licking, but keep on ticking. I know you've lost some battles, but you're not going to lose the war. I know you're injured, but you're not dead. You're tired, but you're not done. You got to keep moving. You got to keep going. You got to keep stepping. You got to keep believing. You got to stay full of faith. People full of the Holy Spirit are full of visions and dreams from God. Keep going. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. God is going to do it, but you got to keep moving. Move, 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 move. Don't you stop. God is going to bring the dream to pass. God's going to do it. God's going to do it. God's going to do it. Come on, I'm talking to some people right now. You need to get full of the power of the Holy Spirit. Your dream's been dying. You're tired. You're ready to give up. If you say, Pastor, this message is for me right now. I want to pray for you. Just throw your hands up right now and just receive from God. God, I pray right now. Pour your spirit out. Fill people with your spirit. Fill people with dreams and visions. People that are tired, ready to give up. Oh God, reignite a fire in them. Give them strength to keep stepping. Give them faith to believe that you're working even in the middle of the trial, in the middle of the trouble. You're working in the middle of the insecurity. You're at work. Give people faith just to keep taking the next step. Just to keep taking the next step. Lord, I thank you right now that you're pouring out your spirit. And your young men, your young women are dreaming dreams, seeing visions. Your old men, your, young, your, your old women are dreaming dreams, seeing visions today. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. It's just eyes are still closed and heads are bowed. I'm talking to some people that don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You're not serving Jesus. You're not living for Jesus. You're far from God today. Some of you today, you've drifted away from God. And you need to rededicate your life back to God. You, you find yourself entangled in sin, living in the ways of the world, and you need to come back home today. Today is your day. There's a dream on your life. There's a vision God has for you. But you need to surrender your life to Jesus. If that's you, would you pray this prayer with me right now? Surrender your life to him. Say yes to Jesus right now by just praying this prayer with me right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. And today I place my faith in Jesus. I turn from my sin and I turn to Jesus. And I confess that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. And I will live for Jesus the rest of my life. Thank you for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.